a really good story. I like, you know, the idea that, like, there are policemen out there at night driving around paying attention to stuff. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> that that definitely makes me feel a bit safer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Night Trooper. And they're, like, watching out for the ghosts. Yes. Spooky. And I like how his generally steely nerves kind of tingled a bit. That's good writing. Yeah. That's definitely. really good writing. And, um, yeah, it, it's definitely written by somebody who's used to writing reports. The mail. The mail. The mail. <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> when he said, I observed a white male in the doorway, I was just cracking up. I was like, oh, my gosh. All right, Night Trooper. This was great. Yeah, thank you so much, Night Trooper. That was awesome. Yeah. And, you know, like, tell your friends. Tell your friends. And actually, when you guys write into us, if you can start, like, in there somewhere, like, I heard about your podcast from... Ooh. Because I don't know where a lot of these people are hearing about our podcast. No. Instagram, maybe? Facebook? Facebook? A friend? The Unbelievers? Serial Spirits? Maybe you're just surfing the podcast store for ghost stories? Don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Where else is our name out there? Tinder. It's not on Tinder anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, <laughs> since I deleted my Tinder, we had, like... Like a, there was like a small dip in the numbers the week after. I swear to God, because I had it in my profile. <laughs> oh my God, you're a lunatic! <laughs> I said I co-host a ghost hunting podcast. So and then all you have to do is Google ghost hunting Amelia. Yeah, and it po- it immediately yes. pops right up. Yes, yes. I don't care. You find I I have a very public presence. But these are Tinder weirdos. They don't need your last name. I was a Tinder weirdo. It's fine. Do t- uh, I have been married a really long time. Do people put their last names on Tinder? No. No, but I, I wrote in the profile, I co-host a ghost hunting podcast, so don't try to ghost me. I'll come find you. <laughs> All right, I just threw up. <laughs> I'm so glad that I'm not in that world. <laughs> it's a terrible world to be in. Yeah, Let's talk yeah. about some ghosts. Okay. All right. So uh, we have some more stories. The next one we have is from Kung Fu Sun. Shout out Kung Fu Sun, who reached out to us today on Instagram and sent a very intriguing photo. So it's so interesting that we were having a conversation with him through the Instagram direct messages. He had sent a picture for us to check out, and Amelia and I both could not figure out what we were looking for. Not at all. So I I had to admit defeat and say, can you just kind of like, you know, like, draw me an arrow? like. <laughs> <laughs> what what am I looking for here? He was very nice. He sent back a picture and he had circled exactly what we were supposed to be looking for. Yeah, so and it was wild. And yeah, it was it wild. Was, it was. Um, so it's a series of two pictures um, taken. the The first one happens and the second one happens. And so this story is going to tell you what pops up in that second picture. Yeah, we're excited. I work on the railroad, and most of the time you're working in the middle of the night alone in the middle of nowhere. The weird thing about this story is that it happened in the middle of the day and there were three other people with me. We were sitting on a train car waiting for our foreman to tell us it was safe to start work. When all of a sudden we started to hear crazy slamming sounds like someone was smashing or pounding the side of the car so loud we thought something was wrong. We jumped up and looked around checking to see if everyone was okay or to see if everyone else was there but we were alone. One of the other guys said, hey, take some pictures. Just kidding around. Maybe we will see a ghost. So I did. No one could believe what we had seen on this picture. One of them said he wouldn't have believed it if he wasn't there. He went on to say how sometimes you forget how much tragedy comes along with the railroad suicides and pedestrian strikes, etc. There must be a lot of restless spirits on board trains just waiting for their stop. We all laughed it off, but you could tell everyone was a little creeped out. I'm creeped out. I'm creeped out, too. Should we now tell people what was in the picture? Yeah. There's a person in the picture sitting on the train. Yeah, so you see the first picture. Yep. And the sun is coming in through, like, the little window in the door at the end of the train. And you can see the beams of light coming the length of the train car. And in the first picture, it's completely empty. Like, there's nothing going on. And then in the second picture, and we didn't pick it up at first because we were busy looking, like, at the floor and... Um, at the beams of light and you got to zoom in you definitely have to zoom in yeah you definitely have to zoom in but there is a head of a guy sitting in one of the seats like yeah just looking it's a silhouette because it's a backlit photo and uh yeah it's creepy yeah it it was like crazy yeah 
well done, Kung Fu Sun. For sure. Yeah. And, and I'm going to throw that up on the Instagram. Yep. So and Amelia's going to put it out there and she's going to tag Kung Fu Sun. And sure if you're interested in his uh, spooky adventures, maybe you go follow him on Instagram. Yeah. 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 Sounds good. Thank and you, you know, Kung Fu Sun. Thank you. That was great. That was awesome. So I was getting the brakes done on my car this week and getting my um, oil change. And I go to Sam's, but Sam wasn't there. But John was there. And so we got talking about ghosts and, you know, like it's just one of those things that I find people in the world and I talk about spooky stuff with them. So is Sam's an auto shop? Sam's is the auto shop. Okay. The mechanic. He's we've been going there as a family for like 25 years, which is pretty impressive because I'm only 25 years old. So, yeah. right. I'm, I'm in there and I'm talking to John and we're talking about, you know, ghost stories and such. And so he told me this story. His own drive-by ghosting. His father died in 1991, and it was kind of a sudden death, and he was, you know, pretty distraught about it. So his father, when he was alive, would get up in the middle of the night and he'd go to the refrigerator and he would get out this gallon of milk or whatever it was he was drinking, and he would leave the refrigerator door wide open while he went across the kitchen, poured himself whatever he was drinking. And then he would go back over and he would put the, the milk or whatever back in the fridge and then close the door. And it used to drive John's mother crazy that he would do this. Like, why don't you just shut the fridge door? Like, I think it drives all, well, I'm, it would drive me crazy if I saw Sean doing that. I know that for sure. And I do that. So I'm sure it would drive whoever I was with crazy. You do that too? I do. It just seems like such a waste of energy to like yeah, let all the cold out of the fridge. Drives my cat crazy. I'm, I'm a vegan. There's nothing that's going to spoil in my fridge. A bunch of lettuce. Okay. <laughs> So John is staying in in the house, and he and his it was his girlfriend at the time, and it becomes his wife later. Um, they're sleeping upstairs in the bedroom, and John just like he he just can't sleep. He's just he's tossing, he's turning, he's uncomfortable. So he gets up and he walks downstairs to use the bathroom, and he comes out of the bathroom, and he's coming back by the kitchen, and he sees a light on in the kitchen. He's like, "What is that?" And he sticks his head around the the doorway, and he looks in. And the refrigerator is wide open. And so he goes in to close the refrigerator and he shuts the door and he turns back to leave and go upstairs. And his father is standing there and his father's like, John, come here, come here. And John said that he regrets this every moment of his life. He was so scared. He ran upstairs. He crawled back into bed and he's like, I pray on a daily basis now that my father comes back because I should have gone over and talked to him. I should not have been scared. And I just I, I just thought that was such an amazing story. His father hasn't come back since then. You know, that that John feels like his father is there in his life, that he, he goes by and, you know, like maybe like feels him go by his face or, you know, it like feels him like kind of tug him by the clothing occasionally, but he hasn't appeared again and been been ready to talk. So that's a really nice story, mm -hmm. but I totally get why that would be extremely scary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't blame John one no, second for, for running. I would do the same thing. Yeah. He catches a lot of crap from his family for having run away. You know, like, I guess his mother told him, he's like, why, why did you run away? You know, why why wouldn't you go over and talk to him? He's like, it's, it's dead. Like, <laughs> he, he's not supposed to be standing there in front. No, I totally understand why he ran. I totally get it. Yeah. At the same time, it is. It's like a, a nice sort of like, dad came to say bye. Yeah. And I think that the vast majority of people out there in the world who have lost a parent or a loved one like that would would react the exact same way if their loved one just showed up to be like, come bye. here. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> well, it's not like he said bye. He yeah. said, come here. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Amelia said, <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us, John, and I, I certainly hope that you are enjoying listening to the podcast and that you got those headphones so that you can listen to it in your truck. I'll talk to you next time something needs to be done in my car. Yeah. Yeah. Have a look at this. And you know what that sound clip means. We have another story from Daniel in Australia. For a while, I practiced martial arts in my 20s. I so miss those youthful fit days. My wide load t-shirt is on order. And the instructor liked to do a lot of outdoor and night training. As one of the fellow practitioners was terrified of the dark to near paralysis level, 
more akin to a child who has just had a nightmare than a 25-year-old adult. I was tasked with escorting him into our city's largest cemetery at night. So we were dumped off on one side outside a huge hedge and told we would be picked up in the same location in 30 minutes. Initially, he was okay. It's well lit by streetlights and the lights from a huge light industrial zone across a wide open area. He went jelly kneed and fell to the ground when we pushed him through the hedge and he found himself standing between rows of Roman Catholic children's graves in near blackness. I'm trying to harden him up and get him moving, acting all tough as I prefer the dark of night. What I didn't tell him was I wanted to get out of the children's section ASAP, as being psychically sensitive to some degree. I had the sensation of terrified children and babies trying to grasp my legs. I'm okay with cemeteries, but children's graves slightly give me the creeps. But for some reason, when I am around Roman Catholic child graves, I can feel clasping hands around my legs. I know they can't possibly hurt me in any way, but it's seriously freaky, feeling them all. Anyway, back to us in the cemetery. At this moment, with me trying not to let him know, I was about freaking out so I wouldn't make him any worse, and trying to get him on his feet to keep him moving, the lights of a security officer's car came over a rise ahead. I hit the deck and told my cohort to shut up and don't move an inch. If we sit still in all our black clothing, we're invisible against the grass and backed by the hedge. It took the security guy almost ten minutes to drive past, shining his spotlight on just about every inch of the area. Finally, he drove away, and we jumped up and hightailed it through the hedge to find the instructor waiting outside. We had been in there for the full half hour. What I never told them was the clinging hands. I especially never mentioned what it felt when I laid down on the ground. My whole body was on the level of the clinging hands, and every inch of me could feel those hands and sense the sadness and profound fear of the children around me. I'm of the belief that of the few spirits that remain when people die, the spirit usually stays where the person died. But young children and infants don't understand what has happened and many stay attached to their bodies, especially for some weird reason Catholic children. I always feel more of those around children's graves. Scary. That is a completely heartbreaking story. Yeah, it's a lot sadder than most of Daniel's stories. Yeah. Kid graves? Yeah, that's sad. And they're they're clinging at him. But well written as always. As always. I do not envy Daniel his um, sensitivities. I don't. um, That's fair. Yeah. I do like his stories, though. He's a great storyteller. Mm. He's great vocabulary. I would like a story with a kangaroo. She's making requests now. He doesn't have to have a ghost, but I think it's having a kangaroo. All right. If he sends us a kangaroo story, you're reading it. Uh, we don't have to read it on. I just, for me. I oh, just, want, just for you. I don't care. I just okay. want to know yeah. more about kangaroos. It's called the internet. I don't want to go on the internet. I want to hear about marsupials from an Australian. Do you like that vocab word there, Beth? Marsupials. marsupials. There you go. Well, coming from Abby's daughter, I'm not surprised that you know the, the fancy name for a kangaroo. They have lots of marsupials in Australia. Have you been? Yep. So you're relying on internet information to let you know that? Nope. No. Steve Irwin. <laughs> I thought he was a crocodile hunter. Yeah, he, but he talked all about everywhere. I have a funny Steve Irwin story. Okay. I was substitute teaching. Yeah. And, you know, like you take attendance. So because I'm lazy, um, I would just send the sheet around and I'd have everybody write their name down. And so there'd be split lunch. So when everybody came back from lunch, I would just read off all the names. And so I'm like reading off the names and people are saying here, here, here. And then I get to Steve Irwin and I just read the name out and everybody laughed. And I'm like, why is that funny? <laughs> <laughs> like, we don't have any crocodile hunters. Oh. Could you imagine that? Like, I mean, like, it's not like somebody wrote The Rock. Like, yeah, that's pretty funny. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) When we were kids, our cousins, Kiri and Max and Nicholas would come over a lot. And Nico was my brother's age, so they'd go play. But I'd go play with Max and Kiri. And I grew up on this big pond and there was a dam there. And (laughs) we were just (laughs) stupid kids. And, uh, We'd take these sticks we'd find in the woods, and there were these water snakes that would hang out. 
and we start poking them with sticks like, oh, look at this beauty. 